Good morning, everybody. We're, we've gone live now, and both in the theatre and online. So I wanted to get us started and get our speaker up and running and uh, enjoy this morning's uh, presentation. So welcome to the seminar. This is uh, a presentation on geotourism uh, by Angus Robinson. I shall come back to his bio in a minute. Um, I'm Rod Kennett. I'm the Director for Discovery and Engagement at Geoscience Australia. Um, and what uh, Angus is talking about is relevant to things like our time walk outside, which is in, indeed itself an example of, of geotourism. Um, I wanted to start the seminar with an acknowledgement of country, uh, and that is Geoscience Australia acknowledges traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people in the uh, capital region. We acknowledge their continued uh, connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, cultures and elders past and present, and of course acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present in the seminar today. Thanks everybody for joining us. Um, today's seminar, in a, in a, the, well, the topic is understanding geotourism and the national geotourism strategy. Our presenter is Angus. In a nutshell, Angus is going to be talking about how by focusing on geology and geomorphology, as well as ecology and culture arising from these geological characteristics, considerable value can be added to nature-based tourism and Aboriginal tourism through the national geotourism strategy. Angus is an exploration geologist by profession and training. He's currently uh, engaged in ecotourism and geo geotourism activities and uh, serves in a pro bono capacity as coordinator of the National Geotourism Strategy for the Australian Geoscience Council Incorporated. And I understand from my readings as I went through it last night, Angus, is that's the, the peak body for some uh, eight, 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 eight of, of the national society. So, so it's a peak body that's representing lots of our uh, professional societies. Uh, he's in that role as a pro bono capacity. Uh, and this is follows his role as the inaugural chair of the Geotourism Standing Committee of the Geological Society of Australia. A long-standing member of the Australian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy, and also a member of the Management Committee of the Social Environmental Society, as well as the Heritage Committee. Um, over the past 30 years, Angus has been engaged in leadership roles relating to technology diffusions through the Warren Centre of Advanced Engineering at the University of Sydney, Technology Park Development, and as the Chief Executive of a major manufacturing industry association. If we could welcome Angus to the podium. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Rod. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to be able to make this presentation and uh, what I'd like to pose is what is the purpose of geoscience? Now, I think, picking up on what I've read, it's to explore, develop and celebrate the links between geological heritage and all other aspects of natural, cultural and intangible heritages. By studying these issues, geoscientists, along with other scientists and geographers, or what I would call geoprofessionals, can anticipate Earth's future and examine any changes that may need to be made. Think about climate change. Today's agenda, I want, I want to follow on what Rod mentioned about what the AGC is about. What is geotourism and its delivery mechanisms? A little bit about the Australian National Landscape Program, and then to focus on the Flinders Ranges World Heritage uh, Area nomination, in which geotourism has an important part to play, the National Geotourism Strategy, and then provide some takeaways. Now about the AGC, it's the peak body for Australian geoscience professionals, and each of those professionals have a vested interest in the delivery of the strategy. The OSIMM and the Geological Society of Australia are the two most active members, have specific roles in the delivery of the strategy. Now, it, the AGC as a peak body serves to raise the profile of geoscience in the broader Australian economy and community by amongst a number of strategies supporting geoscience education in both primary and secondary schools and educating the community through geotourism and outreach. 
In Australia, we, that is the AGC, have embraced the inclusive nature of the geotourism concept and have understood the interrelationship between natural and cultural heritage elements, but it's not geological tourism. By focusing on geology and geomorphology, as well as ecology and culture, it is believed that we can add considerable content value to traditional nature-based tourism, as well as to cultural tourism, inclusive of Aboriginal tourism. We refer to it as, as enhanced nature-based tourism in simple terms. Geotourism offers one of the best ways to communicate the value of geoscience to the broader Australian community. The reason for that is that the AGC is concerned about the drop back of students wishing to pursue earth sciences degrees in Australian universities. And as you all probably know, a number of those universities are closing down courses. Now, it is understood from listening to what young people are saying, they're looking for a different, more holistic experience across the totality of environmental sciences. So that's important for the AGC who talk to young peoples, get them out in the field so they can understand what we have to offer. Geotourism also offers a potential for new industries and employment opportunities for geoscientists through the development of major projects within Australia. It has links with adventure tourism, cultural tourism, ecotourism, wildlife tourism, astrotourism and agritourism. It's not synonymous with any of these forms of tourism, although in broad terms, it embraces them all because it is essentially place-based. It's undertaken in all areas, including places utilized by people, cultural tourism, and where primary industry activities like agriculture, mining, um, agritourism, forestry are pre prevalent. And also in areas with Aboriginal land tenure, or a subject of cultural interest. It is therefore about the place, regardless of its condition, irrespective of whether the land is protected or not protected. The cultural heritage of, of geotourism, we think in terms of holistic Aboriginal culture, in the terms of astrotourism, where traditional operators are showing people the solar system and uh, things billions of uh, years or uh, millions of light years away. Whereas in fact, as far as the Aboriginal people are concerned, they use the sky to talk about how it relates to their landscape. So we're in putting the idea in people's mind, that's what's really going to be important about the place because each place around Australia has a different experience because of the Aboriginal cultural aspects. For an Australian and enhanced understanding of cultural elements, so a whole range of post-European settlement, extensive mining heritage, and other primary industries and historic cultural elements. They are all important and part of the mix. Now, essentially, to try and simplify this, we say geotourism, place-based and holistic, encompasses three elements, the A, the B, and the C. A is biotic, uh, abiotic, which is geology, landscape, climate, etc. Biotic is flora and fauna, and C is culture, both Aboriginal and post European settlement. So we talk in terms of identifying the A plus B plus C characteristic of every potential geotourism experience. Now, the various delivery mechanisms for geotourism, first of all, there's geosites and mining heritage sites. That's just where rocks outcrop or where mines are being built. Secondly, geotrails, which are journeys between sites, and I'll say a little bit more later in the presentation. Geoparks and World Heritage Areas, and I'll speak briefly about those. And of course, geological time walks and rock gardens. Well, here in Canberra, we have a 1.2 kilometre time walk, which outlines the course of geological history in Australia. And so best example we have in Australia and I recommend a visit to it. But we also have the National Rock Garden, which is now being built, uh, located next to the Arboretum, which puts in place specific exemplars of rocks that have been transported from anywhere around Australia, particularly by donors and mining companies, and that in itself tells the story. These are 
mechanisms based on geology, but don't pretend to have aspirations of incorporating biotic or cultural elements. Cultural perhaps because it's important to geologists. Now, in terms of the United Nations programs, there are three areas of activity, world heritage areas, man in the biosphere, and UNESCO global geoparks, all representing different ways in which people relate to the environment across both natural and cultural heritage. In Australia, when we look at the UNESCO sites, we have 20 World Heritage Areas. You'd be familiar with the Barrier Reef, Blue Mountains, Stone Tree, and Lamington National Park, and so on and so forth. We have five Man in the Biosphere um, areas. The last one was declared last June, and zero UNESCO Global Geoparks. And that in itself is a, is causes some concern because there are 177 UNESCO Global Geoparks in 46 countries, of which 41 are located in China, and one for New Zealand next year. And we want to try and do something about that. But we did have a program called the Australia's National Landscape Program, started in 2005, supported by Tourism Australia and Parks Australia, and attempted to be able to create a partnership which promoted high quality visitor experiences, looked at protected areas, engaged with local communities. It was a long-term strategic approach to differentiate Australia's iconic natural and cultural destinations from anywhere else in the world. But unfortunately, that program, whilst it did have similarities with the UNESCO Global Geopark program, as it related to community engagement, education, and experiential tourism, we call that another word for geotourism, and whilst they both require government approval, but with different government stakeholders, unfortunately, the program was disbanded in 2014 for various reasons. And we make the point, although the program has, has been dispensed with, the landscapes are still there, the communities are still there. And there are an opportunity to look at those landscapes and see the, which way that they can be um, developed for geotourism purposes. Those 16 national landscapes are listed on this map and the, the areas would all be familiar with you, I'm sure. But I want to focus on one of those areas, which is the Flinders Ranges. The Flinders Ranges is an important area, uh, and, but is significantly a subject to a World Heritage nomination at a very advanced stage. It's, it's been positioned as the dawn of animal life. And the reason for that, I'll explain in a moment, but I also would like to convey a welcome from my good colleague Hayden Bromley of Booker B Tours. He's of the Adamant for people, and that, that's a word for the people of the rocks. Now, uh, we're very fortunate to have Hayden on board as a member of the National Geotourism uh, Strategy Steering Committee, and he's a great contributor. Now, the Flinders Ranges World Heritage Serial Nomination in the cri key criteria number eight states that the Flinders Ranges is the only place known on Earth where two great experiments in the evolution of complex multicellular life, the Ediacaran radiation event, and the Cambrian explosion of life outcrop in a near continuous geological succession spanning 350 million years. That's the key criteria. The Flinders Ranges is an astounding example representing the major stages of Earth's history, including the record of life, as I've said, that is the evolution of complex multicellular animal life. It contributes to defining the nomination's outstanding universal value. Also, it incorporates the Arkarula site uh, to, in the northern part of the Flinders Ranges, where it demonstrates extraordinary physical chemical processes that are of global significance, which is related to the way the geology has been uh, transformed over the years, so to speak. And it's a, it's a process that's not seen anywhere else in the world. The geotourism potential is there. We think there are a number of areas that can be set aside for protection and management of the region's heritage on both protected, private and leasehold land. 
pastoralism has had a strong historic influence in the region and continues to be an important industry to get today. And there are active uh, communities wishing to be involved in this process. The rich values and breathtaking landscapes make the Flinders Ranges, we believe, an iconic geotourism destination with unparalleled visitor experiences. Now, let's look at the A plus B plus C. There we have uh, uh, the Wilpino Pound, and uh, it's a very beautiful landscape. We have the Arcarula landscape, quite different, rugged. Uh, Mount Painter is a very well-known landform in that area. We have the work that's been done in the development of the Brackina Gorge Geotrail. There we have the geology there, quite straightforward. And uh, what the Geological Society of South Australia have been able to do is to put in place signage, which actually helps explain the geology along the course of that particular geotrail. But it's a very important uh, point. There's, there's our geologists getting quite excited about a particular location. That location is the global boundary stratotype section and point for the GSSP, in short terms called the Golden Spike, and identifies the basal segment of the Ediacaran uh, strata. Very important, and, uh, and the uh, <coughs> national parks are doing a lot of work to be able to make that, that uh, site both safe uh, from uh, vandalism, but also accessible to visitors. Now, when we look at where the Ediacaran fossils have been located, there is what's called the Nilpena Ediacara site, now part of a new national park within the World Heritage Nomination Area. It is an internationally significant site because it shows the fossilised remains of a community of soft-bedded Ediacaran organisms not found in such abundance and variety anywhere else in the world. Well, these fossils are some 560 million years old. And there's information there about them, well uh, explained in the uh, world nomination area. There's the site itself. Uh, Professor Mary Droser, who's done a lot of work in the identification of those fossils over quite a few years. And that's known as the Nilpena Ediacara Assemblage Site being protected and will may be made available for visitations very shortly. The fossils there are small, um, give an idea um, the size of them, they're small, but they're quite, quite interesting in the way that they have developed. And when you look at the, how does that compare to the fossils that we're more familiar with in the Cambrian assemblage, on the left-hand side, you have the these wavering uh, single cellular organisms and on the right hand side the Cambrian assemblage of trilobites and other fossils uh, other species are, have been developed so that's basically the story of the fossil assemblages in the uh, World Heritage nomination site now let's look at the flora of the B the biotic elements of the Flinders Ranges World Heritage area there's a whole range of uh, fossils oh, sorry plants that are dependent on, um, on uh, the conditions relating to geology. It's also influenced by human activity. Native plants sustain the cultural and economic life of the Flinders Ranges and demand for people for thousands of years. And that's a story in itself. And there's at least 85 plant species in the Flinders Ranges are of national, state or regional conservation significance. We look at the kind of flora we have there. This is very typical of the looking across the cypress pine, the famous can you for a uh, red gum tree that's well visited, uh, a famous landmark. Again, more vegetation and then the red gums. And the interesting thing about the red gums is quite spectacular across central Australia and northern ranges and it's been captured by the paintings of um, Hans Heysen. So if you're going to the Adelaide, I do recommend a visit to the art gallery and the paintings will all come to life after you've been to the Flinders Ranges. They're beautiful paintings. When we look at the fauna, the plenty of kangaroos, euros, they've increased their range and population over the years and 
but not so uh, fortunate has been the yellow-footed rock wallaby, which was almost pushed to the extinction, but is now regarded as an iconic species for the World Heritage Area. It's also a very important species as far as the Aboriginal people are concerned. Bird life is rich and varied in the region, with more than 100 native bird species recorded. And that's important because we find that a lot of geologists love bird watching. Uh, it's an activity which appeals to geologists. If you go through the Flinders Ranges, there's wildlife plenty to see, kangaroos, euros, emus. And I might say that's not the, the, the story you see in a lot of other places in Australia where you see such a rich abundance of native wildlife. Yeah, we see kangaroos and the occasional dead dingo, but here in the Flinders Ranges, it is rich in wildlife. The actual geology provides any, uh, uh, wonderful habitats for the yellow-footed wallaby, the scree slopes along, the, um, along those hills. Now you can see uh, the yellow-footed uh, wallaby is well disguised in that particular environment. When it comes out into grass, you see what a beautiful animal he is. The culture is also important. The people. Uh, it, there's a great relationship between the Aboriginal people and the way that they can have interpreted the uh, environment and how they can relate landscape to uh, astrotourism, as I mentioned previously. And there's a lot of land use that has changed the way in which Europeans have operated and the way the area has been cleared and fenced and one thing or another, the impact that's had on the, on the ecology of the area. And as far as the Aboriginal culture is concerned, in the Icara National Park in Wilpena Pound, they have a particular, let me say, exhibit, which explains various stories that uh, Aboriginal people have had. There's one there. Uh, it says, uh, our stories are with the, uh, with these, whatever, passed down ideas in living spiritual connection and the environment. So there's various perspectives that are uh, set out in these series of exhibits. And of course, there is the art work as well, rich in the Flinders Ranges. Moving on to European culture, you've got the Wilpena um, old homestead there and its pastoral history. They also celebrate the uh, work of the cattle dog or sheep dogs over the years, celebrate some of the original architecture of the original buildings. That's all part of the cultural heritage. There is another part of cultural heritage we think is very important, and that's the work of the uh, original geologist, Dr. Reg Spriggs, who was mentored by his friends, Sir, Mo uh, Sir uh, Douglas Mawson, who in fact discovered the Ediacaran uh, assemblage quite some years ago. But significantly, Dr. Sprigg has created a conservation area at Arkarula and set aside for the protection of the environment. And his family have been able to maintain that and develop that as a world-class, outstanding geotourism attraction. He's very much part of the geoscience culture of this country. Now let's look at the whole issue of a national geotourism strategy. Why do we need a national geotourism strategy? As I've mentioned, it's an opportunity for engaging the broader community with geoscience. With COVID, uh, domestic tourism needs to be able to find new ways of building product development to bring tourism to look at our own country rather than just traveling overseas. And that requires innovation in product development. And there's a major development opportunity for rural and regional communities focusing on both natural and cultural heritage, both mining and Aboriginal. And there's emerging grassroots community support around Australia interested in the whole concept of geotourism with some communities liking the idea to be able to aspire to develop geoparks. But in the meantime, we're recommending focus on building geotrails. So we need to gain the support of, the, of these projects by governments and the government uh, body that's responsible for that is the Geoscience Working Group, the GWG comprises the chief executives of the geological surveys in each state and territories, as well as the senior representative of Geoscience Australia. It's working with us to um, develop a process. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Now the strategy, and we developed this 
goals, not in isolation, but in consultation with the geoscience community and in consultation with the GWG. The need for new digital technologies to define an approval pathway for major geotourism projects. We need a, a roadmap to enable companies and proponents to know how to get there. To establish a framework for creating high quality geotrails. To establish a national listing of geosites suitable for geotourism, because not all sites are suitable for geotourism. They need to be protected or they have access problems. And to develop geotourism in regional mining and Aboriginal communities. To strengthen Australia's international geoscience standing. That means to say anything we do create and promote in by way of global geoparks, if we get there, needs to be top quality. Australia can't be putting up second rate product given the geoparks elsewhere in the world are outstanding in the way they are presented and developed. And then to develop and enhance geotourism interpretation and communication skills, particularly for geologists involved, geologists and other people working in, uh, in natural and cultural heritage need to be skilled to be able to get the message across, interpret areas correctly. And we're working with groups such as Savannah Guides to assist us in being good at that particular job. So they're the seven goals. Now, defining a georegion. Now, this is a concept we have developed where we are suggesting that it can be an area defined by a proponent, which might include, for example, um, a local government authority or regional development authority, having completed an approved destination management plan based on geotourism principles. So before they even start getting their plans together, they actually look at what geotourism is about. And we have achieved this already in the Glen Innes Geo Region uh, project in, North, in New England area of New South Wales. And then the proponent really needs to seek agreement from state government agencies, particularly the geological surveys, to see if an area uh, is one, has significant geoscience value, in other words, they get an expert opinion, but secondly, to identify areas of sensitivity, particularly in regards to exploration and mining access. Big, very big issue for the Australian mining industry. So this is kind of like the first step we recommend organisations get involved in. And then, and then we can move on to what are the benefits of a georegion? Well, we, we believe by celebrating the geological heritage of that georegion, all the other aspects I've talked to in natural cultural heritage, geotourism enhances awareness and understanding of key issues facing society. But for example, again, with climate change, we've been able to demonstrate that in the Kuringai georegion. These are enable people to have a better understanding of the holistic nature of natural and cultural heritage. And it gives local people a sense of pride in an area and strengthens their identification with the georegion. Communities like to be involved and that's a one way they can make that step. What are the employment benefits? There's consulting opportunities for natural cultural heritage professionals. Again, uh, reaching one of the aims of the AGC, design of interpretation signage, design of geotrails, management roles in national parks, other forms of areas, working with local government agencies that do need expert support. And then of course the expected flow on employment in tour operations and townships resulting from increased tourism visitation. They're of course overriding social eco, sorry, socio-economic benefit of geotourism for georegions. There's all the flow on multiply effects of tourism generally, which are well identified, but they can apply equally to geotourism projects. There's a better establishment of a higher level of centralized coordination. Australian tourism is terribly fragmented from area to area, state to state, and the lack of coordination is really making things not only difficult to develop, but very confusing for the visitor. So the idea of centralizing the coordination so that we're understanding, working with the same brand and understanding how products can be developed, which meets and uh, gives credibility to the brand is important. So 
through this mission, community engagement is maximised and can be measured. So the role of the community in being part of this pro process is very important. So we like the idea of the end goal two of creating this georegion approach because it's in a sense a exploration license. Like when a mining company comes into an area, they have an exploration process, they do the work with communities, they do the exploration, they look at this, look at that, and there's no presumptiveness until they get to the stage where the government says, we would like you to build a mine and you're keen to do it because you've proved the viability. That's the same idea we're developing with the georegion approach. Give the opportunity for consultation with state government, with the geological surveys, and that's why it's important we're engaging with the GWG to address their requirements. So by focusing on geotrials as being the first easy step is an opportunity for the process to actually have some physical emphasis of how uh, how an area can be assessed and the extent to which that particular meets visitor expectations. So at the present moment, we've got a submission before GWG where the AGC sets out proposed approvals pathway for georegion and potential aspiring geopark development. So we've got a plan, the government agencies through GWG are looking at it and hopefully we'll have a, a decision so hopefully in the next few months. It's been a long process, but it's a very important we get GWG support for what we want to do. Now, the strategy two talks about geotrials, I'm oh, sorry, georegions. We've got three projects active in Australia at the present moment. And these are outlined in the West, the Murchison um, ge uh, georegion, the Glen Innes georegion, I've spoken about that, but also the Karingai georegion. The Karingai Georegion encompasses um, uh, land inclusive of the Karingai Nash Chase National Park, all the land right across to the northern beaches from uh, Barangay south to uh, uh, DY. And that's an important project because it's been conceived by a local community group, the Friends of Karingai Environment, supported by other community groups. It's only 440 square kilometres in area embraces uh, national parks, reserves, the northern beaches area, populated areas, and the, na the national park components about 50% of the area. It's supported by the service, three councils, local MPs. It's approved by the Geological Survey of New South Wales. There's no threat to exploration or mining in that area. And we have recently completed a major natural cultural history document which outlines the, uh, all the attributes, and that's been published by the Linnaean Society of New South Wales. The Murchison Georegion is a quite a different proposal. It's a very large area, over 100,000 square kilometres, and it's been managed by the Midwest Development Commission, which is a regional development authority, and seven councils, based on a concept realised some years ago at one of our geotourism events. It's got a self-drive trail with 21 sites of national, international, natural and cultural significance. It's a journey at the present moment. The potential geopark areas within that will have to be identified, discussed with the geological survey and with the Aboriginal people. So government approvals are yet to be uh, obtained, but the people there are very keen to see some form of geopark or other come out of this process. So the technical access details or each of the sites also needs to be completed. A big project, a lot of interest in Western Australia. The Glen Innes project, which I mentioned, has been approved by the Glen Innes Southern Council and it's driven not only by their particular destination plan, but also by both regional, economic and uh, destination management plan. So it's embedded in their uh, planning mechanism and that's good because it's it's got you know support through various levels of government and it's been featured in a case study highlighted in the Austrive, Austrade Thrive 2000 which is a national tourism strategy launched last year which outlines this is a great opportunity for geotourism I'll explain that in a moment. It's full natural cultural heritage area audit completed so they've done their homework and they've got funding approved for various geo trails and a major rail trail all working within the concept of a georegion and importantly it has a large 
amount of mining heritage sites included within it. Still waiting approval from the Geological Survey of New South Wales. Now, just turning to geotrails, as I mentioned, they should be constructed around routes where relevant uh, used by tourists. The regional geotrails should form logical journeys linking accommodation de destinations. If you're looking at a localised area, you might have a set of uh, geosites over a, a small area. A geotrail links them and, uh, and tells a story. And it has to be a cohesive story so people understand the logic of the of the geotrail concept. And it should incorporate where it is available, package in the biodiversity and cultural components, including mining heritage of the area from which the geotrail traverses. Now, one of the successful uh, local geotrails was developed several years ago at Port Macquarie on the coastline. So in that particular case, the collaboration of Newcastle, uh, the council at Newcastle University, local council, national parks and wildlife, uh, Aboriginal groups put together this four kilometre geotrail. It has signage and also supported by a, uh, a smartphone application. So that's the sort of thing that can be done. And that is interestingly, its biggest benefit has provided a resource for school groups to come down and have something in the field to look at. So that's been the, wasn't realized when it was designed, but that's what's happened. The teachers love it. And we should keep that in mind when we're thinking about other geotrail development. Now, goal five is an important goal because it talks about geotourism being part of rehabilitation and mine closure planning. We would believe that the application of this goal, that's looking at the way of incorporating mining and Aboriginal interests into uh, projects, will help in the rehabilitation mine closure planning process and it's an opportunity to create post mining activity for mining communities. In other words, if mining companies get involved in issues relating to mining heritage and rehabilitation, thinking about mine closure, they're also thinking about what happens when the mine closes. And now we're working on that concept through the OSIMEMS um, Social and Environment Committee to have geotourism be part of the mechanism that companies ought to look at. And that's what I've mentioned there. And we already started this project with an ongoing work with a project underway in the Hercules mine site in um, Rosebury, West Coast, Tasmania. Ge geotourism work has started, it's been mapped out, and the company's looking at what they can do. So we see that goal five identifies opportunities for geotourism in rural and regional Australia, where the surfaces are exposed by mining and their recreational education and cultural values can be readily realized. We aim to draw attention to these places and the range of activities that could be conducted. For example, we're now working with the Central Victorian Goldfields World Heritage Nomination Bid, where they're agreeing to use geotourism as the driver, and in turn will provide the geological and mining heritage advice that they can build the case for their particular nomination. It's an example of what can be achieved. We believe if that is a success, other areas in Australia will say, gee, that works well. We can see how geotourism can work and they'll pick it up. And in that sense, we hope it will lead to other projects around Australia. And of course, there's a whole range of diversity in uh, mining sites around Australia, regions, mine sites, geosites, old mine sites, complexes, all underpinned by rich stories. And by and large, most of which are not incorporated into the traditional geotourism product. We hope that we'll be able to do that. There's an example of those geologists again at the uh, important geotrail site um, at uh, Broken Hill, the Gossam. That's an important part of economic geological geoheritage, not well identified in Australia, but it does need to be done because those sites are important for future economic development as well as being able to tell the story about those mine sites. Now, the key issue we believe for the resource industry in goal five is the acknowledgement of Aboriginal cultural heritage beyond the benefits offered through geotourism, including the need to ensure it is appropriately protected. Think about the experience last year with the Rio Tinto Dugan Caves situation. This will ensure the preservation of Aboriginal cultural heritage is equally as important as that of mining 
and other aspects of cultural landscape, thus leading to improving the public perception of the work of mining professionals and the industries in which they work. The last thing we want is for our profession to be considered to be environmental wreckers and people that don't understand the needs of Aboriginal culture, etc. So this is a key issue that we're working on through that particular strategy. Now, I mentioned the Thrive 2030 Visitor Economy Strategy and Geotourism. Well, that reads, grow and develop high quality products and experiences around unique Australian locations and themes, including approaches which integrate sustainable nature tourism with economic opportunities for traditional owners and capitalizing on emerging tourism trends such as geotourism. We said, hooray, geotourism has been recognized by the tourism industry and we have an action ascribed, endorsed by government to do something about it. Well, this was, this was great. And also they had another one which um, related to the experience for use and availability of technology. And I'll show the importance of that in a moment. So when we look at the new digital technologies, whether they be 3D visualization, augmented and virtual reality, cutting edge work, our goal one and the action 7.7 .7 line up. So we've got an opportunity as an industry sector to show the tourism industry generally, we're at the cutting edge. And a lot of work's been done in Geoscience Australia and the various universities around Australia, augmented reality, where we can be able to show the rest of the tourism industry, how those technologies can be applied through the geotourism approach. We think the approval of the new uh, pathway for major geotourism project talks, that's goal two and action 7.5 work together. And we think the framework for creating high quality sustainable geotrails is part and parcel of the delivery of action 7.5 and to develop geotourism in regional mining and Aboriginal communities, Goal 5 and Action 7.5 are lined up, and it's an area in which we can take a degree of responsibility and ownership. So the takeaways to my presentation today are these. Geotourism is increasingly being recognised worldwide as a major deliverer of nature-based tourism. That is undeniable. And it's important to recognize that the countries which are preeminent in the development of geotourism and geoparks, countries like uh, China, Indonesia, um, good part of Europe, just as a case in point, 46 country are bringing tourists to this country and they know what geotourism is about. They know what geoparks are about. So we've got to have product there that meets their needs. We can't say, oh, well, we don't have geotourism here. Tourists are not going to be interested. It's a highly competitive world. So we've got to be in the business of developing product that tourists from overseas want to see. And we've got to focus on making sure that we put our best areas forward. As the Chinese like to say, they want to see our best scenic areas. Well, we've got a lot of terrific scenic areas and we need to understand that's an important driver for our future. Geotourism will prove a key driver for successful realization of the World Heritage nomination in the Flinders Ranges. We've been part and parcel of it. We've been helping out where we can. We hope when that nomination is approved, the government, state government will say, well, geotourism is the way to go forward. And in Victoria, when the Central Victorian Goldfields project gets up and approved, geotourism will be seen to be a key driver there as well. So there are important developments. Now, I think that tourism destination management planning, that's planning through the process of the strategy, can deliver superior experiences with a geotourism approach. And finally, the government's Thrive 2030 strategy provides a means of gaining tourism industry support for the national geotourism strategy in Australia. I say that, ladies and gentlemen, because Whilst geotourism is being supported by the geoscience profession, and it's taken 10 years to get to that point of time, there's a big industry out there that the tourism industry is about, and we need to work all the time in increasing the understanding amongst the people who are in the process of developing product and selling product, that geotourism makes better sense for them as well. So thank you very much for your attention and very happy to answer any questions.